Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just bring up my presentation. Right. Um, as Lillian mentioned, my name is Sonia Aurora. I'm the lead uh, project manager for the proposal submission modernization efforts at the National Science Foundation. And I'm very excited to give you all our updates on our progress with our research.gov modernization. On our agenda today, I'll provide a brief update on the NSF requirement to use an NSF approved template for a bio biographical sketch and current and pending support documents. Uh, another way you can sign into research.gov, um, an overview of the proposal submission modernization initiative, what features are available today and what lies ahead, the benefits in preparing proposals in research.gov. Then I'll switch over to give you a live demo of our current functionalities in research.gov um, and our updates on our demo site and training materials, our ramp up efforts to increase proposal submission in research.gov, and I'll conclude with how you can provide feedback and where you can find helpful information and resources. Beginning October 5th, research.gov, Fastlane, and grants.gov will run automated compliance checks to ensure the biographical sketch and current and pending support documents utilize an NSF approved format. Non-compliant document formats will trigger an error and will prevent proposal submission or completion of the post-award action. So the automated compliance checks will also apply when a proposal file update or PFU is performed on a proposal. Uh, regarding uh, project reports, uh, the change also applies there. So if you have a pending progress report, you may want to consider to submit it before the enforcement enforcement date. If you decide to submit after 10-5, then the new requirements will apply. Here are some additional resources available to you um, on our updates on the biographical sketch and current pending support requirements. So around March uh, 2018, um, NSF introduced a new centralized account registration process in research.gov um, for our research community that provides each user which, uh, with a single profile and a unique identifier or an NSF ID uh, to log into both Fastlane and research.gov for proposals and award activities. Um, effective September 28th, NSF will enhance the research community sign-in pro, uh, process by providing the option to use your primary, primary email address to sign in to research.gov and for NSF account password recovery. Users will still be able to sign in to research.gov using your NSF ID as you do currently. Uh, this change is intended to make it easier for users to remember their research.gov sign-in information, as well as to align with the industry standards for signing in um, and, and utilizing an email address. Okay. So proposal submission modernization, or what we internally call it PSM, uh, it has been a multi-year initiative to modernize the proposal preparation and submission capabilities in Fastlane and migrate them to research.gov. So why did we start this? Why did we decide to modernize? Fastlane, uh, which was revolutionary at its time, um, now a bit old and it's been 26 years, uh, was built on old technology with very rigid architecture and it's become very difficult to add new and modern features um, and very difficult to maintain and extremely costly to upkeep. Also Fastlane has been just too difficult for our new users or modern users to learn. So our research community already utilizes research.gov for grants management um, 
services such as account management, um, notifications and requests, and project reporting, to name a few. The proposal submission system is a module within research.gov which supports uh, the preparation and submission of proposals. And it is the newest module for our research community, um, but it's been around for a few years now. So for our development efforts, we do use an agile or incremental development process and it has afforded us the opportunity to, to engage with you all in our user community to gather feedback and then incorporate those feedback into our development process ultimately to make those improvement enhancements that works better for you so when we started off our initiative uh, we had five goals in mind and we have met all five in building this new and modern system. So we believe that it improves user experience, improved data quality and capture and capture proposal content um, that supports data analytics. It increases efficiency for proposal management. Uh, it improves availability, security and flexibility. And lastly, and ultimately reduces administrative burden for both um, you all, our research community and NSF staff. Again, with you in mind, um, the research.gov uh, application or system has a fast and easy proposal wizard, uh, which takes you to, through this five-step creation wizard, which I'll demo in just a little bit. Um, it takes less than five minutes. And, I'll, and again, I'll show you in just a little bit how to do that. And we've built in immediate compliance feedback section by section and provides immediate feedbacks and alerts so proposers know uh, if a proposal section is compliant before moving on to another section. We also provide actionable error where you can even look at the column or the row where the error contains and you can um, uh, try to resolve that before uploading the next version. The information in research.gov is, is very, um, you know, easy and more organized, it's less cluttered. You only see relevant sections and actions specific to your proposal. Uh, with research.gov, uploads are instantaneous versus 30 to 60 seconds for each document upload in Fastlane. Also, we provide higher quality of our PDFs. Um, Fastlane redistills the PDF so the resolution is degraded, but research.gov will not do that. Um, one thing I want to note here is uh, regarding font warnings. So we understand it's not meeting your expectation and we heard you loud and clear. So uh, we are working with key stakeholders to discuss ways to improve our algorithm to minimize the occurrence of those warning messages. So now I'll go ahead and uh, switch from our presentation to a live demo to show you the great benefits in preparing and submitting proposals in research.gov. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. All right, so here I'm logged in as API. And once I'm in the proposal submission system, a welcome message pops up. So as we make major enhancements to the system, we will provide a brief update um, with this pop-up message. So let's go ahead and continue. So as you can see, I'm a PI here. So there are two ways in which you can create um, or initiate creating a proposal. One is through your desktop and the other is through the left or uh, the top menu bar. Okay, so let's go ahead and prepare our proposals. So this is the five step uh, wizard that I mentioned to you all before. So the first step is to select a funding opportunity. So I can um, select it by the solicitation number or by keyword search. 
And one thing to note is that if your funding opportunity is not available in research.gov, then you should check Fastlane. So we do highlight that at the top. So for the purposes of our demo, I'm gonna go ahead and select the PAPG. I'm gonna to go to the next step. So the second step is to select the units of consideration. So if this was a funding opportunity with a single unit of consideration, then the data would have pre-populated. In this case, I'm able to add multiple. So I'm gonna just, for our demo, I'm gonna go ahead and add two. Now here we've added additional functionality. Can you see that? Okay. Oh, I apologize. We selected two. Well, I didn't hit save. Let me do that first. There we go. Here we added additional functionality where you can prioritize the order of importance um, for your units of consideration. So moving on to step three is our proposal type. Currently, we have only enabled research proposal type and all other types have been grayed out. However, um, we are working on implementing rapid, eager, raised proposal types in the next couple of months. And once those are enabled, you will be able to select those options. Right. Similarly, for submission type, we've only enabled full proposal, and we are working on implementing the remainder in the coming months. The last step in the wizard is to identify whether this proposal is a single submission with or without subawards or separately submitted collaborative proposal. NSF defines collaborative in two ways, single submission with subawards or separately submitted collaborative proposals from multiple organizations. We have also simplified the questions to minimize confusion and have added helpful information to support you in making the right selection. So for the demo, I'm gonna go ahead and select the separately submitted collaborative proposal. Once this option is selected, an additional question will be prompted asking what your role is on this proposal. Are you the lead or non-lead? So I'm gonna go ahead and select the lead. So once you've made a selection, you can enter the proposal title. Here, we have further distinguished the proposal type by prepending the title. This will also display on the cover sheet. One additional uh, note here, uh, the non-lead organization will inherit the lead organization's title after proposal linking has been established. So I'm gonna go ahead and add. So now I can go ahead and prepare proposal, but one last note here is that once you click on prepare proposal, you cannot undo any of your selections. To clarify, a lead proposer cannot be modified to be a non-lead proposer and vice versa. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that, okay. Now here, what you see is your main proposal page. So at the top, um, these are the selections that I made using the wizard. To the right is the due date. Now, if this was a non-lead proposal, the due date would have been inherited from the lead. Here's a link to the funding opportunity um, for your reference. Moving a little further down, here are your required proposal sections, and a little bit lower are your optional sections. To the left are the proposal actions, and going a little further down are some helpful links and a very useful video on how to propose, how to prepare a proposal. Now at this point, as a PI, I can stop working on the proposal and go ahead and grant access to my SPO or AOR. So let's go ahead and do that. So 
I've received several errors, as you see in red, and you can, we can ignore that for now because we have not completed any of the required sections. So let's go ahead and grant our SPO AOR access. So here there's a breakdown on the level of access I as a PI can grant my um, AOR or SPO. So I'm gonna go ahead and give edit access and allow AORs to submit. I'll go ahead and save that. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to my main proposal page and let's go ahead and add some documents to show you how the compliance checks work and what the error and warning messages mean. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a project summary. Here, as you see, this is an error. So an error prevents me from submission. And it also gives me the error why the file did not take. So it says that it exceeded the one page requirement. Also, you can see that here we've provided very helpful instructions to assist you with this section of the proposal. And you will see this guidance throughout the other sections. So now let's go ahead and try again and upload one that's successful. So the file I just uploaded gave me warning messages. Um, so this is to make you aware that there are unsupported font types in this document. If you need clarification, then you can access the FAQs. And if you still need further assistance, assistance then please do reach out to us. With the warning message, however, you can proceed to the other required sections and ultimately you will be able to submit your proposal. Again, um, you know, to make you all aware, we built in over 89 compliance validation checks versus 56 in Fastlane. And the benefit to you and why more automated compliance checks are good is that it reduces the chances of your proposal being returned without review due to formatting issues. All right, so I wanted to show you how the compliance checks work. Now I'm going to go ahead and add a senior personnel to our proposal. So I'm going to go ahead and manage personnel civil ward organization and click on Manage Personnel, and I'm gonna go ahead and add a co-PI. So you can either add a senior personnel using their NSF ID or through their email. Okay, give me just a second here. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to add a senior personnel document to each of your senior personnel identified in your proposal. So we're gonna to go to senior personnel documents. So for all senior personnel, we require a biographical sketch, current and pending support, and COA documents, as you can see here. And on this proposal, we have two. So effective October 5th, again, to reiterate, NSF systems will require an NSF approved template for biographical sketch and current pending support documents. Our systems will have validations in place to scan the documents to look for the source of origin. So the purposes of our demo, I'll go ahead and uh, upload a COA document. Again, uh, we provide very helpful instructions on your screen so you don't have to go hunt for a, you know, um, a tip sheet or how-to guide. It's right there on your screen. So let's go ahead and upload. So this gave me 
several errors. And so that's, that's the benefit in using research.gov, right? You can, it tells you that you cannot proceed um, due to the fact that this required document um, contains several errors. And we have provided these actionable errors which specifies the row, the column, and the special characters um, to help you focus on the areas of concern. So you can go ahead and correct that file and re-upload that. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, upload a successful one. So if your file has been successfully uploaded or um, you know, there are no errors that's preventing submission or moving on, then you will see a preview of the document that you uploaded. And so you know, we encourage you to double check the information to ensure that is the correct file that you want to upload to the proposal. All right, now I'll go ahead and show you how to add budget to our proposal by selecting the budgets section. All right, so now, um, give me just a second here. Okay. Apologize for that. All right, so we're going to go into our prime organization. Okay, so now here under senior personnel, and you see this manage link, you can go ahead and access that to either remove a senior personnel from your budget. Um, and say you did remove it, and then later you decided to add that senior personnel back. So that's where you can manage um, your senior personnel from your budget. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove Sarah. Okay, now let's go ahead and add a couple of years. Go ahead and add one more. All right, so now as you can see, I'm pretty you know, tight on my space for entering in my budget. So with you all in mind, uh, we provided an opportunity to give you more real estate so you can focus right on the budget. So that's again, by hiding your main menu, giving you that space to focus on your budget. So let's go ahead and put some budget to our senior personnels. Another um, feature that we added is that, you know, you don't have to take out your calculator to do the math. Um, we round up and we roll up the uh, amount for you uh, right there on the screen. So around postdoctoral uh, scholars, um, if you do have uh, postdocs on your um, proposal, in, in this case, this is a separately submitted collaborative, then the lead proposer must submit the postdoctoral mentoring plan for each postdoctoral fellow in the collaborative set. So um, I'll show you how that warning comes up. All right, let's go ahead and save. So it says that we've successfully uploaded the budget and it gives you that information that I just mentioned that a postdoctoral mentoring plan is required by the lead uh, if funds are aligned with postdoctoral scholars. All right. 
So now let's go back to our main proposal page and I'll show you how linking works. So under your proposal action, there is a button called Link View Collaborative Proposals. So in order to link, you would select that button and a pop-up and select the link. A pop-up will display where the lead organization will enter the temporary ID of the non-lead organization. So I want to note that this is an activity that's done outside of the system. To clarify, after the non-lead proposer has initiated a proposal, they will provide the lead proposer with their temporary ID, proposal ID. And so that's what we're going to do here. So I have a sample. Okay. Go ahead and move a proposal so that our linking can work. Okay. There we go. So if the link was successful, then you'll, you'll get the screen message that tells you that a link request has been initiated. So once it has, the non-lead organization will receive an email and a notification in research.gov to update them that they have received a proposal link request. So a couple of things I wanna highlight from a non-lead proposer's perspective. So once the non-lead proposer logs in, um, they will see all of their link requests at the top of their in-progress proposals. Um, the non-lead organization's title, funding opportunity, where to apply, the type, due dates are all inherited from the lead organization. Another note is that the order of submission doesn't matter. So what I mean by that is that a lead can submit before the non-leads and vice versa. This is because for, separ for separately submitted collaborative proposals, all proposals in the collaboration must attain what's called a submission pending status before the collaborative set can be submitted to an SF. So in this case, the priority in who submits first does not matter. So the last thing I want to note here is that the system do not have the capability currently uh, to withdraw proposals at this time, but it is in development and it will be available in the near future. So if you need to withdraw a proposal, please contact our NSF help desk. Now, um, for the last part, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to um, do a PFU and a budget revision for a submitted proposal. I'm gonna go back to my desktop, go to the proposal submission system, and view submitted proposals. All right. One um, other note uh, that I wanted to mention is that in a collaborative set, um, you are able to submit a PFU as long as there are no reviewers assigned. So if, if the reviewers have been assigned, then you can only do a budget revision. Okay. So here it is. This is under proposal action. That's where I'll be as a PI. I'll be able to prepare my PFU or budget revision. So while that's working, so for a PFU, um, a PFU justification, a proposal update date justification is required. This is an indication that you're also at the right place. Uh, so you can go ahead and update the section that you want. So let's go ahead and update a project summary. I delete what was submitted and upload the new one.
Now go back to my main uh, proposal page and you can see that the updates have been saved and it gives you that indicator. Also, it tells you that the last updated was today at 11.33 a.m. So once you're done, you could go back uh, and revise any other section as you need. Now for a budget revision, let's go ahead and update our budget. Now, if your budget has decreased by 10% or more, you must submit a budget impact statement. The requirement is not enforced by our system, but it will be required in order for NSF to issue an award. So keep that in mind when you are um, doing a budget revision. Okay. Now, one last thing I want to note here is that um, once you've done your revisions, you must reshare um, proposal access to your SPO AOR. Uh, it doesn't get carried over from the in original submission. So just to note that. Right, let me see if there was anything else. So this concludes the demo. Um, but I want to show you some additional resources that's available to you all. So anytime you have any feedback for us, please uh, go ahead and uh, click on the feedback link here and, you know, let us know how we're doing. Uh, let us know if there's areas of improvement that we need to take a closer look at. Um, other additional resources. So we have taken great strides in redesigning our about page with new and updated FAQs and other contents. Um, so we hope it's helpful to you as you, um, you know, transition over to research.gov or as you work through um, proposal preparation and submission. So here it is for proposal preparation and submission. Um, other ways you can stay updated with us is go ahead and sign up, you know, to our listserv. So where if we have imp important updates, um, you will have the latest and greatest. Also, opportunities uh, to keep updated with NSF updates, which is around policy and on research.gov um, progress. Uh, you can sign up for the ERA forum. We have one coming up this fall, uh, early November. So if you'd like to get additional um, feedback on those, please do sign up. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and switch over back to the presentation. Okay, so updates on our research stack of de demo site and training materials. Um, we're very excited to announce that we are well underway with our development efforts for our demo site and it's coming this fall. Um, we've also collaborated with various FTP committees um, to gather feedback. Uh, on our demo site implementation. So we're very excited on that partnership. Uh, for our training materials, um, you know, from the 2019 PISPO survey, um, did hear a need for additional training materials such as how-to manuals, guides, um, perhaps a training kit for organizations. So we are enhancing those areas. Um, in addition to uh, the demo site, which is also used as a, a, a training opportunity. So we are working on those um, as we speak. Oh, I'm sorry. So while the development is underway to increase functionality in research.gov, we've also been working on um, a wrap-up strategy with our NSF senior leadership and key stakeholders 
uh, to increase proposal submission. So why is there a need to ramp up now? Well, the results, again, from the 2019 SPO PI survey reveal that there's a great deal of frustration in using two systems for proposal preparation and submission. Also, there's been a great deal of confusion in selecting which application is best suited for proposal submission. So how do we plan to ramp up? Well, with our phased approach, our strategy is to gradually transition our user community in phases to minimize burden on both our NSF staff and our research community. In addition, we'll be expanding um, our foundation-wide efforts to update our research community on our transition plan and progress. This also includes the issuance of an important notice, and we are very excited to announce that our NSF director has just signed the important notice. So the, for those that do not know what this is, it's the important notice is a top-down approach in disseminating information um, from our NSF director or from NSF to key officials of institutions and organizations. And lastly, and ultimately, updating the PAPG and the PAM to remove references to Fastlane and replacing it with research.gov. So when do we plan to kick this off? For phase one, we've already started with the biodirectorate. So the biodirectorate will start with your- 24 hour telephone banking system, press one. If you're looking for branch Biodirectorate will start with their core, no deadline solicitations, and then migrate the solicitations with deadlines incrementally. So soon, the Biodirectorate will be publishing a Dear Colleague letter to notify the bio community that they are migrating to research.gov. So for our future phases, we are working with each of our NSF directorates to identify core programs such as the no deadline ones to only reference research.gov and grants.gov as the only submission system options. So stay tuned for more information coming. Now here are some additional resources and I, I highlighted some of that during the demo on again, where you can receive updates on research.gov and Fastlane. So do you sign up to our listserv and stay updated on what's happening with NSF at the ERA forum um, on policy, on research.gov um, modernization. So do sign up and use these opportunities um, to also communicate with us on how we're doing. And thank you for your participation today and I'll take any questions that you all have. As a reminder, you can put the questions in the chat box or you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask it out loud. So, Sonia, there's a number of questions already. Um, do you want me to read those out? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, first question was, are there any plans to expand administrator role permissions to assist with account email uh, address changes or corrections. So this relates to uh, ability to log in and get uh, information from research.gov um, using your email address. Um, so right. I, th I think that's probably my actually my question to answer. Yeah. Um, so for research.gov as a whole, we no, we don't plan to add additional administrative rights uh, for account access. The philosophy here is that um, users need to be uh, responsible for their own uh, core profile information like emails and, and passwords, um, and that administrators, institution administrators should only be responsible for uh, aspects of that account that relate to the institution. So for example, roles and responsibilities. So that, that's not currently on the, on the roadmap. Next question. Is there a role that can be used to view all submitted proposals but not have any editing rights uh, for senior leader, leadership? If not now, is one coming? So there, if you have um, 
if you've been granted access to all the proposals that institution is working on, you should be able to see that um, as in progress proposals. But in terms of a dashboard or you know um, something to kind of take back to senior leadership, uh, we could take a look at that. Well, let me, let me add, uh, so um, one of the first services we introduced on uh, research.gov was the proposal status, and uh, SPOs and AORs have uh, access to view the submitted proposals there. So if you look on research.gov front page, it's one of the first, uh, first choices. If that's not working for you now, you only might be able to see proposals uh, for your institution. If you're not seeing those as an SPO or AOR, um, you know, contact us and we'll, we'll look into it. Okay, next question is, um, do the optional elements adjust according to the requirements of the specific solicitation? So I think that means like, um, say, 15 page uh, project description. So, right, so we currently do not allow um, 15 or more, uh, uh, more than 15 pages uh, for for let's say program description at this time. So, you know, we do have other systems that we're working on um, modernizing and there will be some opportunities down the road for us to uh, weigh those. But at the present time, uh, you know, there are programs that may say, if you, if you wanna deviate, then you may submit under the PAPG. But if the solicitation specifically says that, then Right now, what we're saying is fast lane is the only option. Unless, again, uh, you know, in our internal processes, if there is one case where something needs to deviate, then, you know, it requires a higher level approval um, to make that happen. But otherwise, research.gov do not allow um, any deviations at this time. Yeah, so let me let me add let me point out uh, Sonia in your presentation you were talking about the uh, you're about to add other uh, proposal types like goalie raise eager etc that you know are examples of this where the solicitation has different rules and um, when those when those are implemented when those are enabled on your wizard then we'll we'll enforce those rules okay um, Question, do the optional elements, oh, we already did that one, sorry. Uh, will there be any accommodation in the validations to allow for slight bleed of figures into the margins? We received a warning about the fonts, uh, still submitted, but wondered if this is something that research like a validation should address or leave as a warning. <laughs> we're, we're taking a very close look at our warning messages, uh, as I briefly mentioned earlier. So we hear there's uh, you know many, many areas of concerns around that, especially to our law tech community. So we, again, we're taking a close look at our um, algorithm to see if there's any technical solution that we can implement to minimize the occurrence of those warning messages. Um, but any feedback that you have will be greatly appreciated as we work through this. All right, next question. Will Fastlane submittals phase out? That's the plan. Um, the plan is, as I shared with you all today on our ramp up strategy, is we don't have a hard date yet, uh, but we are working on migrating um, core programs to utilize or to only allow, um, you know, grants.gov and research.gov submissions. So we are doing that. We are just starting off. Um, again, that started off with our NSF director signing off on that so we can closely partner with our directorates to get this going. All right, uh, any plans to accept uh, collaborators and other affiliations templates that have been edited in applications other than Microsoft Excel? Uh, example was my faculty end up with blank uh, COA files if they edit the file in Google Sheets or OpenOffice, even if it's saved as uh, XLS file. Um, you do, do you want me to handle that? I mean, I would say, you know, we're not planning to, I mean, this is basically a production support issue. So if you could send us examples um, through our help desk, we can try to troubleshoot those. Um, but, uh, you know, no, we don't plan to expand beyond Excel for either Fastlane or research. Did you want to add anything, Sonia? I'm sorry. No, oh, that's, that's right. Um, can budgets be uploaded as uh, XLS or CSV files? 
Not at the present time. Um, right now we provide the budget on, you know, to be populated on screen. And so that's the only um, option for now, but we have heard from our user community on the opportunity to have a template uh, to upload the document. So we are looking at that. Okay. Uh, we have seen margin errors and header warnings when uploading Science EV biosketches in the fillable biosketch PDF. Will those be fixed by October 5th? Uh, I defer that to you or? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer. So um, basically the answer is uh, after October 5th, uh, you will not get those uh, warnings or errors or those warnings about the fonts. Um, yeah. All right. Um, will the demo site be set up to allow test submissions to be submitted through grants.gov and then displayed on the demo site? So the demo site and, and our first iteration of that will be with limited capabilities. And so we are only going to allow users to uh, prepare proposals. So you cannot submit, um, but we do plan to, um, as more users are starting to use a demo site, we would like to get feedback on whether you would want to see submissions and how that works and other areas of, um, expansion. So for uh, for the first round, um, for our demo site, it's just to prepare research .gov proposals. Yeah, let me add to that as the grants.gov person for NSF. Um, yeah, we, we know the ability to see the proposals uh, submitted and test is important. Um, and before we decommission Fastlane, we will, we will come up with some way uh, for that to happen. Um, so we still got some time to think about that, but yeah, we, we understand that that's, that's, a, uh, that's needed to support test submissions. Um, uh, will this presentation be available afterwards? Yes, uh, I can make it available. Lillian. So yeah, I think Lillian's gonna talk about that uh, when we wrap up in a few minutes. And um, last time I submitted in research I got, it told me not to have num uh, uh, numbering in the documents. However, the PAT-G told us to put in num page numbers. What should we do? Jean, do you want to take this one? Jean, we can't hear you. Um, yes, we got this issue. Um, and uh, we are looking at ways that we can address it best for the future. It has been raised. We're in the process of doing the PAP guide revision for 2021 now, and we're looking in this entire space of language on fonts and spacing and things of that nature and pagination that are in that particular part of the PAP guide. And so um, we are aware that people are asking these questions and we're taking a look at it now. Okay. Um, what is the timeline for implementing phase one? Is it imminent? So it is well underway. And why we say this is because um, we've already identified the core bio solicitations. And so it is in the clearance process as we speak. Um, we do, um, you know, anticipate it hitting the streets in the next coming weeks. And so the, um, the important uh, takeaway here is that we were waiting on our senior leadership to sign off on the important notice and that's been done. So there is going to be communication through a dear colleague letter um, from the uh, from bio directorate to the bio community. So that once that's in place, there will be more information on when the solicitations are gonna move to research.gov. So it's coming. Okay, so um, our faculty are reluctant to use research.gov because they're used to Fastlane. Uh, it would be helpful, helpful to have a target retirement date for Fastlane so that we can make efforts to train faculty, even if the actual retirement date changes down the road. We hear you. Uh, we hear it at every conference, every forum. Um, and so we are closely working with Jean and the policy office on, you know, when what's the reality on that date? Um, and so we, 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 we're at this time, we're trying to 
you know, um, minimize confusion, chaos with the migration and transition over to research.gov. So we can't really put out a date because we kind of want to do this carefully, um, you know, and, and guide you through this because we want it to be a success for everyone, right? And so it's really hard to get that date down. Um, so right now, we don't have a date, uh, but we're working on it. Well, and I, I, let me just add to that because um, the reality is as Sonia went through our process and what that ramp up strategy was, that we will have directorates that were already. So you're saying, well, when will we have to? Well, in some cases right now, in the very near future, when some of these directorates start uh, implementing their ramp up strategies, you're going to be required to use either Fastlane or Grants.gov. So it is critical that your faculty, and we've got already got commitments from other directors beyond bio. And so your faculty, number one, really need to pay co close attention um, to what that solicitation says, because that's going to dictate um, whether or not uh, what systems NSF will be permitted to use during this ramp up period. And I'd also like to make one more point as I go beyond the last question about pagination, because, I mean, we are getting these questions. There are times, for example, where we have something in uh, the path guide and um, because Fastlane is still in there and it's still dedicated to both research.gov and Fastlane, that you're really going to need to follow the instructions on the screens in the system you're using in order to tell, you know, about preparation. So uh, research.gov, for example, does do some things that Fastlane doesn't do, pagination, for example. So if you are using, you know, uh, research.gov, you would not have to include that. However, if you're using Fastlane, it still tells you to put a pagination in there, and it doesn't paginate, so you're going to have to do that yourself. So a couple of important points. Read those solicitations now very carefully, and read the instructions on the screen very carefully as well, because the, 20, the 2020 and 21 versions of the PATH Guide are a little hard for us because we are in this transition phase. And so um, it's, an, it, it's important that folks pay attention to what the guidance is to ensure um, you know, that they're, they're, they're following. And we're trying very hard to make sure that we have um, our language as clear as possible and our requirements as clear as possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Jean. Thanks for that. Um, uh, next question was, uh, please clarify the NSF approved formats for BioSketch and current pending support uh, is effective for uh, proposals submitted on and after October 5th. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, big time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, how can the PI delegate the ability to work on a proposal to a staff assistant? So currently, you know, you can share your access and it's only to the SBO and AORs that's been uh, associated with that institution. So if it's an assistant, I mean, they could be set up maybe as an other authorized user. Yeah, that's um, right. yeah that would be the, uh, the way to do that. Okay, uh, next one is will S2S submissions work better with research.gov than S2S submissions work with Fastlane. Um, I'm not sure I understand the community. <laughs> Kyle Burkhardt, you could add some, um, you know, our, our SLA, our service level agreement is that any proposal submitted to NSF, no matter what the channel is um, equivalent and looks, looks the same, works the same uh, for review. Um, that's, that's our goal, and I think uh, I think we do pretty good at that. So uh, I guess I'm not, I'm not understanding that question. Um, as the director of an SPO office, I will need to see all proposals submitted. So I think that was that's a duplicate question. So go check out proposal status. 
Um, are there any plans to allow an AOR or other delegate to initiate a proposal on behalf of a PI as is currently possible for most other federal sponsors? So we have uh, been asked that again, so it's been have that in the backlog, but that is really, um, you know, because it really does start with us kind of discussing those um, requirements. So we do have that. It's, it's, it's uh, in our backlog, but it, it's there. Uh, we are going to discuss that. Okay. Uh, SPO and AORs have editing slash uh, submit rights. We are looking for a role with no edit or submit rights, just the ability to view all submitted proposals but have no ability to change submit like the SPO ARR can. So, I so you don't have to um, grant access. So you can do view only access, right? Um, the PI can use that as a as a option um, to manage the proposal. Um, and so, even for AORs, uh, they don't have to have submission abilities. They can have edit or view abilities if you wanted to do it that way. All right, thank you. Uh, are there plans to add wording addressing the new RPPR current and pending requirements on the about project reports page on the research.gov site? Um, yeah, I think we could, um, you know, I think there'll be, yeah, we have a whole communications um, queued up. Uh, there's a ton of communications gonna be flooding your inbox is very soon on these and on that and other things related to the October 5th cutover. Um, yeah, that's a big day. P pay attention to October 5th because that's uh, all, you know, the formats go into effect, new terms and conditions go into effect on October 5th, a new version of the RPPR go into effect on October 5th, just to be fun. I'm, we're in the process of working on our implementation of 2 CFR 200, and I've asked for all the comments on October 5th. So October 5th is going to be one of those big days, uh, but there are a, Dave's right, we're working a lot of communication strategy for the RPPR to make uh, faculty aware of what specific changes were made to that document. Thanks, Jean. Uh, next question is for Lillian. When do you anticipate making this uh, the FDP presentation recordings available on the website? Would be great to be able to share this in the Science CD presentation before the October 5th deadline. Lillian? That actually um, does a good job of leading us into sort of our closing remarks. 